Started. Um, thank you for joining us for our case discussion of complex non tuberculous mycobacterial cases. Um, if you haven't already, please uh, participate in our live polling by opening up this uh, website either from the Chest Events app or you can uh, go to that website directly from your mobile browser. And uh, you just click on the session, uh, which is non tuberculous mycobacterial cases, uh, and then the, the questions will come up automatically as they come up in the PowerPoint presentation. Um, my name is Mark Edelman. I'm a third year fellow in pulmonary and critical care medicine at NYU. And our uh, panel members are Dr. David Griffith from the UT Health Sciences Center at Tyler, Texas, Dr. Ted Maris from the University of Toronto, and Dr. Dorina Drizzo Harris, also from NYU. Uh, I should also mention that this session is being live streamed on YouTube, so hello, Internet. Uh, I have no financial disclosures, and our panelists have uh, the following disclosures, which you can see on the slide there. So let's start with our first case. She's a 72-year-old woman with a history of irritable bowel syndrome. She initially presented to an outside institution with homoptosis. She described bright red blood that filled the toilet bowl. Prior to that, she reported a minimal chronic cough, um, some chronic lethargy, shortness of breath when walking up subway stairs, night sweats, or weight loss. Other past medical history was notable for mitral valve prolapse, insomnia. She had had no surgery. She took lorazepam as needed for her insomnia and she had reported some uh, GI intolerances to a few antibiotics in the past, like erythromycin and oxybloxacin. Uh, she had a minimal uh, smoking history in the past, remote, uh, no ETOH or illicit drug use. Uh, she was a college professor and reported no occupational or other environmental exposures. So a CT done around the time uh, that she presented with hemoptysis was notable mainly for this, there we go, this nodule with a small bronchiectasis, mucoid impaction here in the left, and so the cuts here, more, sorry, it's pointing to the impaction, bronchiectasis in the lingula, most of the right middle lobe as well, and another nodule on the left side with maybe a, just a hint of cavitation there. <coughs> so she was prompt given the reported volume of the hemoptysis. There was no evidence of active bleeding, uh, and cultures at that time were notable for MEVM. Uh, on two, uh, two different uh, cultures and no bacterial or fungal growth at BAL. So our first question is what would you do now? Would you begin treatment with azithromycin, rifampin, and ethambutol three times weekly? Would you treat with azithromycin, rifampin, and ethambutol daily? Would you give uh, azithro, rifampin, and ethambutol daily plus amikacin IV three times a week? Or would you just monitor the patient at this point, her symptoms and imaging? Okay, so pretty good spread of answers. Um, I'll open it up to our panel now, based on what we've heard so far. What would your recommendation be for treatment? So I, I think that, uh, that there isn't clearly a right answer. Uh, the guidelines suggest that in habitary disease, one ought to treat with daily therapy. However, um, a fairly large retrospective studies included patients with very small cavities, like this patient had, uh, up to a centimeter, a centimeter and a half, and reported on thrice weekly therapy with good outcomes. So I think thrice weekly or daily might, uh, might be appropriate, and depending on other mitigating circumstances, more aggressive therapy with parenteral agents, although I, it doesn't sound like what uh, I might have done is you know, certainly could be appropriate, or monitoring, although I'm a little less comfortable and has a little bit of and I agree that this gets into um, uh, kind of a gray area uh, about what what is a cavity and what isn't and how do you define cavitation it's always it always comes up when putting trying to put manuscripts together we, we sort of use two centimeters as a, as a cutoff so this is 
kind of uh, six one half dozen the other, I think. Uh, the reason it's important, though, and, and uh, is cavitation is very clearly associated with worse prognosis, uh, including increased all-cause mortality in pe people with mycobacterium avium disease. Whether you call this cavitary or not, I, uh, I guess uh, maybe it does make a little bit of a difference because if you believe it's cavitary, then the guidelines suggest parenteral therapy would be appropriate. Um, it's a, I, I think it's a tough call. But, but uh, I have to say that uh, it, for the reasons that Ted mentioned, I think that there are three answers on this slide that are reasonable. Uh, so um, I, I don't think I would have started with parental therapy. And I will say, uh, there's pretty good data about nodular bronchiectatic disease and three times weekly therapy, but there's really not a lot of data that says daily therapy is better. Um, we, I think all of us believe it is maybe. Uh, let's go, it's a toss up. There aren't any perfect right answers to these questions, so. So we'll keep going. Um, so as I said, she was initially at another institution where she was started um, on a daily regimen of azithromycin, rifampin, and ethambutol, but she reported intolerable diarrhea to rifampin, so she was continued on azithromycin and ethambutol only for 18 months, and at the completion of that uh, treatment course, her sputum did remain uh, culture positive for MAC. Also, at some point, uh, when she was giving sputums uh, for analysis, uh, an aspergillus species grew, at least for those sputum specimens. And she still reported intermittent blood streak sputum and exertional dyspnea. So about two and a half years later, she had another CT done uh, that we were able to review. Uh, and as you can see, clearly the cavity on the right has gotten bigger, probably even without my pointer that I, there it is. Um, <laughs> so much larger area of cavitation now. I don't have a caliper or anything, but it's probably getting to be at least two centimeters there, um, and probably similar uh, disease on the left, but the most notable finding is the increasing size of that cavity in the right upper lobe. So at that point, um, one of her sputum samples was sent for drug sensitivities. It was confirmed to be chlorothromycin sensitive. The amicacin MIC was 64 <coughs> micrograms per milliliter. And then um, by another uh, physician, she was retreated with azithromycin, rifampin, and ethambutol uh, three times weekly this time and she was actually lost to follow up after about three or four months of treatment, primarily because she wanted to pursue some alternative therapies. Uh, about a year after that, she came to our emergency room complaining of two weeks of fever and productive cough. Uh, she had a low grade fever, she was satting okay on room air, had some scattered crackles on auscultation, no real elevation of her white blood cell count. But her CT was notable, again, for the cavity on the right and um, much more consolidation now surrounding it, more nodular disease on the left. And so let's ask another question. What would you do at this point? Would you now treat her with azithromycin, rifampin, ethambutol? Uh, azithromycin, rifampin, ethambutol PO uh, plus uh, alone or plus amicacin? Or would you treat with vancomycin and piperacillin for the back ham? Would you give her a boriconazole? Or would you give her all of the above? <laughs> okay, so another pretty good spread of the results. A good number of people would like to treat her with all of those agents. So I'll ask our panel at this point, with uh, increasing cavity and now uh, acute on chronic symptoms, how would you manage it? So I think um, even in Texas, this is now a cavity. <laughs> um, I, what I find particularly challenging in folks like this is the coexistence of the aspergillus and now what seems to be a lot of halo around the cavity. And I don't know um, if the aspergillus is playing a role in making decisions about treating with antifungals and the interactions with azoles, especially in the interactions with rifamycins. I find really, uh, really quite difficult. I probably would try and limit my focus to one class of organisms first, and if, if I'm not sure, I'd um, collect a lot of sputum um, and see what kind of, if I get smear numerous coming up multiple times, then I would probably focus first on the, on the uh, NTM. Yeah, just to talk about the, the MAC therapy, just for a sec, the, just, uh, in, in the literature that in the last couple of years, there's been several papers looking at the emergence of macrolide resistance uh, in MAC therapy. And 
just to reinforce a, a, a very important point, the critical elements that in the regimen is that ambutal. So um, the, this is a drum I like to beat in public whenever I get a chance. If you happen to send your uh, respiratory specimens to laboratories that give you in vitro susceptibilities for more than macrolide and amicacin, which they're not supposed to do, but if you get um, a sputum that shows an R next to ethambutol, please do not exclude ethambutol in your regimen. It's extraordinarily important. And this is a good example. Uh, this patient has cavitary disease and was on two drugs, but still maintained uh, macrolide susceptibility. So that, that's really very important. Uh, a quick note, the 64 micrograms per milliliter for amicacin is still in the, in the susceptible range. There's pretty good data that above 64, that the clinical response uh, is poor. Uh, so am amicacin will still be appropriate uh, for this, this kind of a patient. And just a quick um, uh, comment, I, I would not, for instance, this is not a patient where I would use inhaled amicacin. You've got an enlarging cavitary lesion in a pretty sick person. This is not someone that would at least initiate that. But I want to toss it back to Ted. You know, th this is, uh, a scenario that is extraordinarily difficult. Uh, we isolate fungi from many of our patients. Uh, so, I'm, Ted, how, how would you how would you try to, to evaluate the contribution of uh, aspergillus? I have great difficulty in doing so um, at one point in time. The cross-sectional view of the patient. And I thank you very much for asking me. Um, I, I think that the, the only way I can figure it out is to um, see how a patient responds to therapy over time. So I would take my, my best guess in a patient like this who's had MAC for a long time and has an enlarging cavity, and assuming she's, uh, she's smear positive at this state, I would focus on her MAC therapy, try and treat her aggressively. And, uh, and see how well she responds, continue to collect sputum. So, and I think that's what we did. I think Mark's going to tell you this slide, but we were focused really on the NTM initially. Uh, she eventually got, you'll see many of those things on that, on that list, but I think we focused and we tried to get uh, as many sputums as possible. So, why don't we go on? So, this is uh, the time that Dr. Drizzo and I actually met the patient. Um, we did start her on broad spectrum antimicrobial therapy, vancomycin, and piperacillin, and tazobactam. Um, we weren't sure, as you guys mentioned, what the contribution, if any, of the aspergillus was. So we didn't start any antifungal therapy, but we did start uh, MAC meds with azithromycin initially, IV while she was in the hospital, ethambutol, uh, and she was actually hesitant to continue any additional meds at that point, although we had some conversations with her while she was an inpatient. Um, her sputum uh, bacterial culture was just pharyngeal flora, but the AFB smear was positive, which then uh, you know, several days later did uh, culture uh, to MAC. Uh, positivity, and then on the fungal culture, there was moderate candida, uh, and still some rare aspergillus growing on that as well. But as I said, we uh, thought it would be better to hold the oriconazole for now. She was afebrile in the hospital. Her productive cough was improving, so we actually had a pick line placed in her. We discharged her home on oral azithromycin, ethambutol, and we added rifibutin, 300 milligrams daily, because of her previously reported GI intolerance to rifampin. And we also gave her cefepime to complete a 14-day course. However, within just a few days, actually, she complained of uh, much higher fevers at home uh, and worsening of her cough again. She said that she had been adherent to the PO and IV meds that we discharged her on, and she was tolerating the rifibutin without any significant GI adverse effects. Uh, so she came back to the emergency room, and now her CT looked like this. Um, significant worsening of the consolidation around that right upper lobe cavity. So we'll ask another question for everyone. What would you do at this point? Would you broaden the antibacterial coverage? Would you broaden the antimycobacterial coverage? Would you now start the antifungal therapy with oriconazole? Or would you perform a bronchoscopy with a BAL and TDBX to get more uh, diagnostic uh, information? Okay, so bronchoscopy with BAL and TDBX. Uh, and another significant minority of the group would have started boriconazole at this point. Uh, so we uh, discontinued the cefepime, we continued the MAC meds, we actually changed her antibacterial regimen to levofloxacin, added amicacin um, for some gram-negative coverage, but also MAC coverage as well, 
and she continued to be febrile for about another three days. So we did then at that point bronch her, the BAL had a neutrophilic predominance, the AFB smear was negative, but then uh, you know, about a week later it was culture positive for MAC. There was also moderate aspergillus on the BAL. The TBBX didn't really help us that much, it was a pretty nonspecific inflammatory infiltrate. Uh, there were no granulomas, there were no AFBs, there were no fungal organisms in the biopsy, uh, and cultures from that biopsy didn't grow at all. She continued to be febrile for another four days, and now I'll ask everyone, what would you do at this point? Would you add clofazamine? Would you now begin antifungal coverage with voriconazole? Because we hadn't started it at this point. Would you stop all antimicrobial medications? Would you refer her for surgical resection? Can I ask if the VAL smear was positive for fungal elements or just the culture? Just the culture. Sorry, the question was, was the BAL smear positive for fungal organisms? And no, the answer was just the culture. Okay, so a lot of people would start uh, voriconazole at this point, and about an equal number would um, refer her for surgical resection. So we actually did see, we stopped all of her meds. Um, we stopped the levofloxacin, azithromycin, rifibutin, ethambutol, and amikacin, and she actually defervesced. Uh, she remained afebrile for several days, but she continued to complain of productive cough, dyspnea with minimal exertion, walking in the hallways. And so after about a week, while she was still an inpatient this whole time, we repeated another CT scan, given her continued symptoms, even though she was a Can I make a quick comment? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah uh, and I, I think that was, uh, I, I agree with that. And we don't use a lot of rifibutin, but uh, uh, fever and constitutional symptoms are actually very common with rifibutin. When we, when we started doing MAC therapy back in the 90s, we gave everybody rifibutin and we, it, and it got, we abandoned it because so few people were able to tolerate it. And I, I would bet anything that, the, that her fever was, was uh, rifibutin related, which is too bad because I think rifibutin is a better drug uh, against MAC than rifampin. David, David has a crystal ball. Yeah, that was our impression as well. And <laughs> sorry, we, no, we thought good. we were right uh, given that the fevers went down. But as I said, we repeated a CT scan. And as you can see, the consolidation around that right upper lobe cavity just continues to worsen, significantly worse, over a matter of just one week. A couple more cuts, um, so still more consolidation there in the right upper lobe, and left side still looking pretty similar um, with some of the nodular disease. So now what would you do? Would you restart the prior anti-MAC regimen? Would you now add clofazamine? Would you now give her voriconazole? Or would you refer her for surgical resection? good split between starting the antifungal coverage at this point or uh, referring her for surgical resection. Um, and in fact, that's what um, we did. We decided it was probably at this point time to start the voriconazole because we hadn't until now. So we gave her IV voriconazole. We consulted thoracic surgery uh, who requested a trial of the voriconazole to see if she would respond to that clinically. Um, and then after a week on antifungal medication, we got a CT, which again was really no better, uh, really worse um, with the consolidation there. Um, I don't have a good cut of the cavity right here, but the consolidation is just becoming more and more um, in the uh, right upper lobe. There's a little bit of the cavity. Okay, so she went for uh, initially a VATS, which had to be converted to a muscle sparing thoracotomy to have a right upper lobectomy. We continued voriconazole initially, but on the surgical pathology, all that was seen was necrotizing granulomas with AFBs, no fungal elements. So we actually did stop voriconazole after that result was available. Um, resumed her antimycobacterial regimen of azithromycin, ethambutol, uh, some nebulized amikacin, and we did not continue uh, rifibutin or another rifamycin because of concern that it was actually the rifibutin that had caused the fever uh, while she was admitted previously. Her sputum did eventually convert to negative about four months uh, after uh, her operation. Her cough, her exercise tolerance have improved, and here's another CT several months later with still some of the bronchiectasis, nodular disease, but overall improved, certainly not any worse and nothing like what we were seeing in the right upper lobe when she first presented. So some questions that I have for the panel is, um, would you consider this a classic presentation for uh, MAC or NTM pulmonary disease? Um, we treated her pretty aggressively with a lot of different agents, and I wonder if 
would you have done the same and what factors would have led you to do, uh, to do so? And how long would you recommend that she continue on MAI treatment after surgery? So I'll, maybe I'll uh, go first. Um, and I would suggest that it started off as a classic presentation of NGM pulmonary disease, but the somewhat fulminant uh, aspect at the uh, latter part of the case makes it, uh, makes it a bit unusual. Um, what factors may have led to such aggressive disease, uh, led to such aggressive disease? I think that's a, that's a good question, and I don't know why sometimes MAC can progress at a more rapid rate. It may be the presence of multiple pathogens that can facilitate some synergistic action. I'm more accustomed to seeing something like this in Mycobacterium abscessus, which may sit for a long time and then perhaps uh, due to it, perhaps related to a change in the colonial morphology, the organism morphology, um, we see uh, a more rapid, uh, rapid progression. Although I have to say that, uh, this is not uh, a, an extremely rare type of uh, evolution of MAC that's been longstanding, so it can, it can certainly happen and we have to be prepared for it. How long should she continue on MAI treatment post-surgery? Based on zero data, but a lot of anecdotes, um, until she, a year after conversion or a year after surgery, uh, whichever is, uh, I don't know, maybe longer. Yeah, I, I, I agree, Ted. I, this is an unusual case. Um, I'm not used to seeing, not, I guess you couldn't describe this as fulminant, but kind of a MAC pneumonia. It, it just, I've seen it a few times, but it is unusual. Just a couple of uh, random thoughts. Uh, uh, this, I think, points up to the uh, importance of uh, surgery in, in a lot of our patients. Um, there's, the data is very consistent. That if surgery is indicated and the patient can tolerate surgery, it helps. And people do better from, in a microbiologic, uh, from a microbiologic standpoint if they can have surgery. And there's a ton of caveats that go with that. Um, but I think it's always worth it, at least some time in the course of every patient with MAC disease to say, would this patient benefit from surgery? And of course, most of the time the answer is going to be no, but it is worth thinking about. Uh, I probably uh, would have used intravenous amicacin just because in the perioperative period uh, it's so important to control the infection as, as, uh, as best you can for healing, but you know, obviously this person did well. She would have, that was our first choice, but she was not going to go home with another pit line. Okay. All right. And uh, I'd like to thank Ted for taking a swipe at the last guidelines and uh, agree that I would, I would shoot for 12 months of sputum culture negativity on this patient as well. Okay. Any uh, questions from the audience about the first case for our panel before we move on to the second case. Please come up to the mic if you have any questions. Um, uh, I'm Victor Hofstein, I'm a respirologist in Toronto. Uh, uh, to me, this is an unusual case given the rapid progression and such massive consolidation. But I want to back to Anisi. I want to go back, I, I want to ask a question about an easier part. When she first presented with a small cavity and hemoptysis and the bronchoscopy showed the uh, uh, positive AFB. Now in some patients with MAC, well, or MAI, um, Mycobacterium maybe I should say, cavities can be transient, particularly small ones, and they can wax and wane. So my question is, in this patient with bronchiectasis, when she presented initially, would it have been any, would have it been a value to treat her for infectious exacerbation of bronchiectasis rather than starting on, starting her on a potentially toxic therapy? And what I mean, just give her a quinolone uh, for you know a couple of weeks, uh, for ten days, and just see how she does. Uh, obviously she would have progressed, but would that be a, a, a reasonable initial approach to treat somebody with bronchiectasis first presentation with small cavity for infectious exacerbation of bronchiectasis rather than for mycobacterium avian disease? 
Yeah, so I think I think that's very reasonable and in all patients who have bronchiectasis I think we want to look for other pathogens first and and potentially treat those before we know, even know if the NTM is is what's causing their problem my question in this case is when that cavity increased to about three centimeters um, should we have thought about surgery back then I don't think she would have been amenable to it but you know um, you know at what point uh, do you do, I mean, she was pretty sick when she went, eventually. It would have been nice to do it in a more elective fashion. So, you know, maybe we really should have been thinking about that two years prior, or whoever was seeing her. But, okay, thank Impossible you. Impossible to predict, is it? It isn't, right? That's what makes it fun. <laughs> All right, so we'll, we'll move on to our second case. This is a 52-year-old woman who has a history of multiple reported allergies. Uh, she presented to our institution for a second opinion regarding management of her bronchiectasis. Uh, she reported about two to three years of lethargy associated with some left-sided pleuritic chest pain, dyspnea on exertion, night sweats, <coughs> headaches. She didn't have any significant sputum production, and she also had no weight loss or anorexia. She had a past medical history notable for basal motor rhinitis, mitral valve prolapse, generalized anxiety disorder, uh, and some uh, orthopedic and neurologic issues in her feet. Um, she had had orthopedic procedures previously, was on uh, some antihistamines, nasal, uh, steroid nasal sprays, uh, and propranolol for her mitral valve prolapse with some palpitations. She had a history of erythromycin uh, anaphylaxis and anaphylaxis to shellfish as well and a rash uh, when she was exposed to iodine at some point. She also had a remote uh, smoking history, rare ETOH and no illicit drug use and she used to work as a physician's assistant uh, with no occupational or environmental exposures. So a few cuts of her uh, CT, um, notable mostly for cavity there, or excuse me, uh, consolidation nodule there in the right middle lobe, um, maybe some mucoid impaction and some bronchiectasis uh, in the lingula as well. See more of the bronchiectatic airways, it's a little bit of uh, bronchiolitis maybe. And uh, she had a bronch done by an outside uh, physician which grew um, MAC. Uh, there were no drug sensitivities requested at that time. She was given azithromycin, developed hives, and underwent a prolonged outpatient desensitization uh, she also was given rifampin and ethambutol. Uh, she reported eye swelling as well as pruritus in her hands and feet. It wasn't entirely clear uh, which was the inciting agent for those symptoms, and, but she was continued on rifampin and discontinued ethambutol. So she came to our institution for a second opinion, as I said, on azithromycin uh, daily and rifampin daily. Had been on it for about three months. She had no real change in her initial symptoms since starting the medications. Uh, we were not able to induce sputum successfully, uh, but we did get another CT, which was really unchanged from the one that was done three or four months pr uh, prior. So, this always concerns me, azithromycin and rifamycin alone. Does it concern you guys? So, uh, concern that we're going to be inducing azithromycin, uh, macrolide resistance, and um, she was already on it for, th right, she was taking it for three, three months. months. Yeah. Okay, so, um, not a good thing, but let's go on to the next okay. So what would you do at this point? Would you continue azithromycin and rifampin alone? Maybe not, considering what Dr. Grizzard just said. Uh, would you put ethambutol back into her regimen? Would you give her clofazamine? Or would you um, discontinue the meds that she's on and begin an airway clearance regimen? Um, Okay, good, everybody's paying attention. So she wouldn't get azithromycin or rifampin alone, resuming ethambutol, uh, or maybe adding clofazamine, and a uh, majority of uh, respondents would actually stop the meds, begin an airway clearance regimen. That's actually what we did uh, at that point, given the, her symptoms were a little bit atypical, her imaging was not um, all, all that um, terrible, um, and she didn't have any response symptomatically to treatment over a few months. Uh, so she did start an airway clearance regimen, even with that, was not really able to produce sputum, uh, said she had worsening non-productive cough over the next several months, even with 7% saline daily nebs uh, and a percussion vest. Her night sweats persisted. She had some low-grade fevers subjectively at home and said she was losing weight, 5 or 10 pounds. So we did repeat a CT six months later. This is the, uh, after she was off medications for nine months, and there was some worsening disease. Now there are some new nodules. There's one. Uh, these are all new. A little bit more kind of tree and bud here and here on the right. So now, what would you do? Would you resume the azithromycin, rifampin, and ethambutol? Would you uh, give her azithromycin and rifampin and add 
three times weekly IV amikacin? Would you give her azithromycin and rifampin and give uh, clofazamine? Or would you do a bronchoscopy with BAL to get a specimen for sensitivity analysis? at this point to try to get um, sputum to get sensitivities considering the nature of the regimen that she had been on before. That is what we did. Uh, so the AFB smear was negative and there was actually no growth on the AFB culture uh, in the end. There was uh, low growth of a Pseudomonas uh, species and um, she complained of some low-grade fever and pleuritic chest pain for about a week after the pronk. We did give her uh, levofloxacin for 10 days um, just because the only species that grew was Pseudomonas and she was having some symptoms. Uh, but it didn't really make any change in her chronic symptoms. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. yeah. Uh, what are we going to do with the susceptibility data? Well, I think we wanted to confirm that the uh, macrolide was still sensitive. Okay. Um, primarily that. Okay. Um, Just check. And only that way. We were only going to use it for macrolide and azithromycin, um, excuse me, and uh, amicacin. So now what do we do? Should we resume the azithromycin, rifampin, and the thambutol? Should we give azithromycin, rifampin, and the IV amicacin three times a week? Would you give azithromycin and rifampin with clofazamine, or would you consult an allergist for desensitization before giving her any of these meds? Um, we uh, did consult an allergist given the nature of her previously reported uh, reactions to um, the meds, particularly azithromycin uh, with the hives and the history of anaphylaxis to erythromycin. Uh, the allergist recommended outpatient graded challenges to ethambutol and rifampin uh, because it was unclear if those represented true allergic reactions, uh, but an ICU admission for azithromycin desensitization after that. She did have a positive graded challenge to ethambutol, but unfortunately it wasn't possible to uh, desensitize to ethambutol because of the available uh, dosing formulations. She had a positive graded challenge to rifampin as well and actually declined the rifampin desensitization, but she did agree to an ICU uh, elective admission for azithromycin desensitization, which she tolerated pretty well and was discharged on azithromycin uh, 500 milligrams daily. Uh, we placed a PICC line, gave her uh, amicacin 15 mg per keg seven days a week initially, uh, adjusted the dosing by monitoring her trough levels down to five days a week after about a month added clofazamine, 100 milligrams daily, and she's been on uh, the medications for about three months, tolerating them pretty well without severe adverse effects. Uh, her renal function is stable on the amicacin. There's been a mild decrease in her hearing uh, at the very highest frequencies on audiograms, uh, but that's been stable uh, since the, that initial finding. Uh, her cough fatigue and night sweats have nearly resolved, and she's gaining weight as well. Uh, and she just repeated a CAT scan just a couple, just about a week ago, uh, and you can see there's been response in the nodular disease on the right uh, from, compared to May. Still, obviously, with the... Uh, so we, the when we, re when we wrote this, we didn't know what the CT would show, so we were just lucky that it's <laughs> resolved at this point. Uh, just a few more cuts of the CT. Okay, so now what? Should we continue the current regimen? Would we continue uh, azithromycin and clofazamine but change the route of the amicacin to inhaled? Uh, should we continue the uh, oral regimen but decrease the amicacin IV further to three times a week? Or should we continue azithromycin and clofazamine only uh, but discontinue the amicacin? People would like to change the root of the amicacin, uh, somewhat fewer, decrease the frequency of IV, and a uh, significant minority would actually continue azithromycin and clofazamine alone. I want to ask our panel, um, what would your uh, preference be at this point as far as her medication regimen? So I think this is a pretty significant challenge, and it's uh, uh, an issue we come across in, in most of our patients who we use amicacin, in whom we use amicacin for a significant period of time, 
data from National Jewish a decade or two ago suggested that a third of patients are going to get significant um, ototoxicity from amikacin or streptomycin either at a uh, dose in this range, 15 mg per kilo, they use five days per week, or a higher dose, 25 mg per kilo, thrice weekly, no difference, both about a third, in both groups after 12 weeks, about a third of patients had significant hearing impairment. Um, the longer we, and the only association was age and duration of therapy. So we know the older the patient, the longer we use it, the more hearing loss there's going to be. So we need to do something about it. Switching to thrice weekly um, will probably attenuate the speed of hearing loss, but I think will probably also increase it'll probably shorten the time at which you have to stop amicacin altogether. So I think using inhaled is very appealing um, since we tend not to see much ototoxicity at all with uh, even plain old amicacin sulfate inhaled, although we should still monitor for it. Um, I think I'll leave it. Yeah, uh, well first I, I would, I'd like to compliment you guys. I mean, that's a tough case and you, you really patient clearly benefited from the, the care that you took. Um, we dose amicacin a little differently than at National Jewish and, and it, it uh, almost uh, becomes a, a philosophical or metaphysical argument uh, because of the, of the poor correlation there is between drug levels and MICs of the organisms. Um, so that um, you know, and it's, but it's hard for me to, uh, to be very strident about our approach uh, in terms of efficacy, but uh, we do dose the amicacin uh, more toward the 8 to 10 milligrams per kilogram range three times a week, and the ototoxicity is significantly less. Uh, patients are able to tolerate it for a longer period of time. However, I, I, I do not have data that would suggest that, it, that it's more efficacious. I am a little worried about the inhaled uh, amicacin uh, off the shelf. Um, there's no one that studied that. Uh, there's just surprisingly little data that's available uh, about that. I mean, geez, you know, folks have been doing this for a decade, and you 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 can't name five studies that have been that have been uh, sent that have been put out. Now, um, I also worry about the distribution of the drug in the lung. Uh, as everyone is aware, it's very uneven, and so you're going to have areas where there's uh, uh, sky-high levels, and then you're going to have uh, areas with no coverage at all. Uh, so, you know, my personal feeling on a case like this where you are succeeding uh, would be to try to extend the intravenous amicacin as long as you could. Uh, but at some point, I mean, and this may be split in hairs, you're going to, you'll make the switch. And, and so I don't think anybody would argue with that. Um, and as I think everyone is aware, um, there is an inhaled amicacin preparation, it's a liposomal preparation, where preliminary data, where there are pretty good preliminary data that it, that it looks good. Um, and, and frankly, if, if that holds up uh, and, you know, if there's FDA approval uh, of, of that, uh, that drug, um, I think people would be a lot more comfortable about uh, putting somebody like this on, on an inhaled drug. Dr. Prickley, Dr. Maris, could you comment on this? Second. So yeah, I think some of the concerns that we had here, first of all, I don't have sensitivities. So I mean, we're lucky that she's doing so well because if she was macrolide resistant, the CT would not look the way it does right now. But so um, I'm presuming she's macrolide sensitive since she responded so well over the last um, several months. Um, but we don't have many drugs to use here, and I think that's the reason we started with IV, and it really wasn't a choice for her. I was worried about initially just oral azithromycin and inhaled uh, amicacin, and again, was I going to induce macrolide resistance with that regimen? Because we didn't start, we didn't get clofazamine approved for her. I was, it was after she was on azithro and in, um, IV for a little while. So I guess the question. Um, Go ahead, you want to ask a yeah, question? Yeah, no, I was, I was going to ask about option D. Uh, let's say, for instance, that she was having more significant adverse effects uh, from the amicacin, either the hearing loss was getting worse or maybe, uh, you know, uh, worsening renal failure. 
Uh, is there any data for possibly using azithromycin and clofazamine alone in a patient like this? So I presented uh, two studies at the uh, year in review uh, using clofazamine, but in a triple drug regimen showing it's not inferior to azithro with amutol. One study was um, from the NIH group, I believe, and one study was from, no, excuse me, uh, uh, Dr. Daly's group, and then one study was a Canadian study that was done in Calgary. Um, but what about azithro and clofazamine alone uh, as, as a, a duo drug regimen? I'm not aware of any any data. It sounds like you did just recently review this, and I don't think there are any data. So it may be um, some corner that one might be forced into, but not a corner I want to be in. Uh, I don't know if clofazamine does anything to reduce the risk of macrolide resistance, and I'm not sure that two drugs are are good enough. So I, I would there wouldn't be my wouldn't be my choice. Uh, for, for sure, and I try and convince the patient strongly to to continue some other some other agent. Yes, and I, I agree. I, I think the you know the studies you mentioned, Doreen. Uh, I think at best it it is like the rifamycin in the standard three drug regimen, where it probably helps prevent the emergence of macrolide resistance. But whether it's efficacious on its own, they're they're actually. Uh, is an on there is a trial that's about to start in the uh, I think just uh, Ted you're part of it okay uh, in the United States looking at clofazamine monotherapy for for MAC disease so hopefully we might get some idea if it, if it's uh, effective or not and uh, I would like to congratulate you for not putting a fluoroquinolone in the uh, in uh, as as an option although it would have been interesting to see how the audience would have. Uh, would, would have thought about that. Right, and, and there are many from the, uh, from the uh, register, looking at uh, practices, uh, survey data, excuse me, uh, the European uh, survey data that came in that was published this past year uh, found uh, usage of fluoroquinolones for NTM disease. Uh, it was in the 60% range or close to 60%. So uh, without any evidence of in vitro or in vivo uh, activity. So there you go. Um, we actually sort of addressed these yes. questions as far as the IV versus yes. inhaled, but um, how long would you continue therapy in a patient like this if we're unable to get sputum, even from a bronchoscopy, we didn't get any positive results? Um, so what would be your end point for a patient like this? So I guess if her audiogram wasn't too bad, and if she just had a little bit of changes in maybe the high frequencies, I would reduce her to thrice weekly um, or twice weekly, um, depending on what I, after the discussion I had with her, and maybe go for several more months and watch her audiograms and pay attention to her sy symptoms. Because I, my personal anecdotal experience is that inhaled amicacin sulfate is not as good as IV uh, amicacin. So any questions from the audience for our panel about the second case of uh, challenging drug allergies? Would you mind coming to the, to the mic? Okay, the, the question was, or the instruction was, uh, talk more about clofazamine. Why? From Dr. O'Donnell. Dr. Dr. O'Donnell is available in Canada. We'll, so, let, we'll let Dr. Maris talk. It's available. Since the data, most of the data come from Calgary, and Calgary's in Canada, I'll, <laughs> I'll say something about it. Um, I like clofazamine because my patients are all pale in the winter, and it gives them a lovely tan. <laughs> I like clofazamine because it's better tolerated than many of the other drugs we have. But I admit readily that we don't have any, as Dave, as Dave pointed out, we don't have any data to suggest it does very much uh, in the regimen. We don't have much data at all to understand its individual contribution. And um, that's why one of the reasons I'm really excited about this monotherapy study to see if there's any signal in uh, changing the burden of organism in, in patients with MAC. I mean, can you give us uh, the U.S. side some practical advice about clofazamine because people, you know, hear these talks and say, well, how do we get clofazamine and should we really use it? Because yeah. the data is even less, right, than for amicacin. I mean, oh, yeah. I give this patient amicacin and 
zithromycin alone. Yeah, uh, and you know, um, it's, it's a, that's a tough one. And um, uh, clofazamine's been around for a, a long time. I, I am a clofazamine doubter. Uh, until recently, I had I, I almost never used it. Um, I'm I'm using it now, sort of in the kitchen sink uh, scenario. However, um, as as uh, Doreen said, there there's a little bit of, of data that suggests in multi-drug regimens that uh, there may be benefit from from use. And I, I I'm like Ted. I I uh, I would. A third drug, even a weak third drug, and let's face it, rifampin's a weak third drug in the in the standard regimen, um, may still be beneficial. So clofazamine is more readily available these days. Uh, I'm told that the people at the FDA are are, are tired of having uh, individual INDs requested, so they're trying to expedite uh, approval of them. So getting it is really not that big a deal these days. Um, it's not a first line drug, but uh, you know, as Doreen mentioned, the armamentarium is pretty weak, uh, pretty thin. So uh, I, I think it's a reasonable choice in a, in a case like this where you, you've tried very, very hard. But I would like to just reinforce the idea. There is just no information out there that fluoroquinolones do anything in this disease. The only thing fluoroquinolones do is put your patients at risk for macrolide resistance. So I, I, I have abandoned fluoroquinolones in the kitchen sink. I d just do not use fluoroquinolones in this, in this scenario. I would like to add that I don't think we have evidence that fluoroquinolones don't do anything. We just don't have any evidence that they are particularly helpful. And um, we, the, the data are very, very thin. A study from Korea where in non-converters, fluoroquinolone was added and a proportion of those patients converted in the subsequent 12 months. It's hard to know what that means. And a small RCT looking at a quinolone ethambutol rifampin versus macrolide ethambutol rifampin done in Japan, I believe. It was really too small to make conclusions from, but there were conversions in both groups. We just, know, we just don't know whether they're helpful. I, I don't know that we know that they're not helpful. Well, I would only say that in this in the last year there were three or so um, uh, good good series on macrolide resistance, you know, from Korea and Japan, and a, a common thread through all of them was the combination of macrolide and fluoroquinolone. Dual therapy. Dual therapy. Two companion drugs. Right, but rifampin in that scenario I would consider to be uh, pretty weak, you know. Uh, well, I. Um, it's hard to prove the negative, Ted. Well, I, I, I'm not, I'm not um, suggesting the folks run out and use uh, fluoroquinolone macrolide in all their patients with no companion drugs. But it may be, I think it may be useful in the kitchen sink or other scenarios. So, and one of the reasons, is Ann still here? Um, one of the reasons that we added clofazamine is because I was just uncomfortable with azithro daily and then intermittent amicacin therapy and I didn't want to I'm hoping that it's helping prevent macrolide resistance. I have no data on that at all, but that's the reason that we added it. Just, just can you comment, I, in the last year I've had a rash of people, 70 would be a great age. If I could get somebody 70, that would be nice. But I've got, for instance, a 91-year-old woman came in and the, the, the connector is the hemoptysis, but growing mac, um, airway inflammation on the bronch, as well that's very disturbing not very happy about the idea of the medications can you give us a weight or a you know, airway clearance treatment alone that might be helpful in somebody who you're just afraid you don't want to kill with your treatment so I, I would say for that first of all again as the person who came up to the mic earlier look for other other pathogens other than the MAC that might be causing her symptoms and treat those first I'm also always hesitant to start airway clearance, at least rigorous airway clearance therapy in someone who is having hemoptysis. So that's gonna potentially limit it. I don't know how much she's having, but if it's significant, then I um, will be uh, concerned to start that up front and probably would want her on antimicrobial therapy first for some length till I make sure that that's controlled. Um, 
Mark, do you want to make a comment or a second question? When you're done. Okay, and the the um, the airway clearance techniques that we do use, there are many that you can use. Did you want a list of them? No, I just want your where you rank that in the in antibiotics versus non-antibiotic therapy. So that's a good case to present. I mean, you know, when should you treat? When do you do airway clearance? Um, in nodular disease. Uh, I like to start airway clearance first. It's part of the regimen. Sometimes that alone helps with sputum production, improves symptoms, and in someone who's got relatively stable disease and isn't rapidly progressing, we may just do airway clearance for a while and follow them and see how they do. I, I don't think everybody needs to be treated, certainly with mild to moderate disease. Sometimes airway clearance is enough. Um, so in your 91-year-old lady who you're worried about putting on meds, um, but we do treat 91-year-olds too, and I would be, you know, careful and monitor things if they are progressing. Sometimes you can get good control of symptoms. Start with three times a week therapy. Make sure the dosing is appropriate for the age and the renal function, uh, and watch them closely. Did you want, want to add anything? Mark. So, so if I remember both cases correctly, you had failing regimens in patients who were at, at least at one point on 250 of azithro, and erythromate. When do you check azithro levels to see if levels? Yes. Yeah. So the question was, uh, do you ever check azithromycin uh, blood levels? Or do you just go to 500 sometimes? When do you increase the dose? Because well, of Mark, there's absolutely no data that suggests that circulating levels of macrolide make any difference whatsoever. And in and it makes sense. It's a drug, as you know, azithromycin is concentrated in in uh, in white blood cells and tissue, and with sky high levels th that you measure. So the question, would would it help to push the dose? And I guess the answer, my my answer is I don't know. But I, I wouldn't check a dose? level. Does anyone? Somebody wrote somewhere about checking levels, but I had never heard anyone talk about it. I had never done it, so I wanted to make sure I wasn't. Got to be national Jewish. Yeah. yeah. So there, there are a couple of studies that have looked at azithromycin levels, and there's some very murky data that suggest maybe the peak level does have a correlate with outcome in thrice weekly, but not daily therapy. Very difficult to wrap your head around. The, 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 the confusing aspect of that is that thrice weekly has the 500 milligram dosing um, versus the 250 daily. I, I don't know. We can't get levels in Canada. We have to ship them to Denver. So, at least from the NTM perspective, I don't do levels because it's, uh, it's just, I don't have the infrastructure to do it. And I think increasing the dose is appealing in some situations, and I, I would definitely do it in some cases. So we'll uh, move on to our third case, and uh, if there's any other questions about the first two cases, we can try to address them at the end. But our third case is a 77-year-old woman with a history of GERD and bronchiectasis who reported productive cough, intermittent blood streak sputum. Uh, she had a CT scan at some point that confirmed the presence of bronchiectasis with some tree and bud nodularity and a right middle lobe atelectasis. She had a bronchoscopy done uh, outside of our institution around 2012 for homoptosis. Uh, cultures from the BAL grew uh, at that point M. avium and uh, M. abscessus. She was given a regimen for M, M abscessus, uh, including cefoxetin, amikacin, tigacycline, and azithromycin, uh, which was discontinued after two to three months because of adverse effects, and she was actually lost to follow-up for a period of time. So this was her CT initially, um, with this nodule there, some bronchiectatic airways, some mucoid impaction, tree and bud nodularity on the right, and then on the left. Here's her pretty atelectatic right middle lobe with bronchiectasis. So she came back to see her physician about two years later, uh, did not have a CT scan or a bronchoscopy done at that time, um, but had a chest x-ray that was notable for a new cavity in the right upper lobe. Her sputum was sent for routine and AFB cultures. It grew actually several bacterial species, and now the AFB culture grew M. abscessus Uh But she was again lost to follow up for a few months. Uh, but then she was referred to our institution several months later, reporting symptoms of dry cough, dyspnea on exertion, and fatigue. Her weight was stable. She had no fevers or chills or night sweats. So we repeated her imaging and sputum. Uh, the sputum was negative for AFB growth at that time, and the CT did show some progression of the right upper lobe cavity from uh, the chest x-ray that had been done outside. Um, there's now an obvious cavity in the right upper lobe, which wasn't present on the prior CT. 
Um, she had drug sensitivities that were actually done previously from the culture that grew out of Sessus Pilettii um, with the sensitivity pattern that you can see there. She was treated at that point with azithromycin and linazolid daily, inhaled amikacin, and uh, IV uh, amikacin was recommended, but she declined. Uh, and actually, a couple other IV therapies were recommended as well that she didn't want, so that's why she went with the inhaled amikacin. Um, she de declined clofazamine as well. Um, so uh, before we go any further, I just want to ask our uh, panel if you guys could comment on that uh, treatment regimen based on the sensitivity patterns that we're seeing there. So, um, the, uh, sorry, I'm out there, the macrolizer. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about the sensitivity panel. I don't know how this lab functions in testing for macrolide susceptibility, but mycobacterium obsessus, understanding the macrolide susceptibility is very complicated, and the subspeciation of Belletti versus obsessus versus Massiliens is so important in that both Belletti and obsessus, I believe, usually have a functional ERM41 gene, which is associated with inducible macrolide resistance. I, I don't know if this lab does prolonged incubation or, or, or characterizes the ERM gene. We didn't, have the, we didn't have that information. It was just in the physician's note, and we didn't. So we were kind of working with, we, so we didn't really know if the macrolide was sensitive or not. So presumably there is inducible macrolide resistance, so the macrolide just on the basis that this is subspecies Belletii, so the macrolide is likely doing very, very little, if anything. So this is inhaled amicacin monotherapy, um, which uh, e even with, uh, even if I knew the macrolide was working, the two drugs alone I wouldn't feel comfortable with. But, oh, sorry, she also had some linazolid in there. Um, I, so linazolid amicacin therapy. Um, so I, yeah, I'm not happy with it. I, I like your recommendations more, um, and I, I want to get more information from the from the lab to understand the uh, drug susceptibility. Yeah, I agree completely. I, I, would, I would add just to um, just to reinforce the importance of the uh, of uh, the laboratory uh, doing what what's right here is the. Um, uh, in our in our lab, about 20% of the abscessus abscessus isolates have mutations in the ERM gene that, that deactivate it. So they really are. So about one in five are going to be uh, macrolide susceptible, and I assume for Belletii it's going to be the same. Um, so the the phenotypic susceptibility here is is really important. This patient, it, it's very clear that for all of the abscessus complex organisms. Abscessus, abscessus, palladia, miscellians, that macrolide susceptibility is the key to successful therapy. So even though it's a, it, you know, it's a bit of a flyer, uh, you, you know, somehow the, a good laboratory's got to get hold of this bug and, and give you accurate information on that. The only other thing that was a little odd is the topromycin susceptibility, which, uh, as I'm sure many of you are aware, that, that's characteristic of Mycobacterium chelone. Uh, which is macrolide susceptible. Chelone does not have an ERM gene. Uh, so, and another reason to get this bug to a lab that you like, uh, just to be sure that the uh, ID on this organism is, is accurate. If this is really Mycobacterium chelone, you don't have to mess around with the rest of this. You, you know that it's macrolide susceptible. So, so agreed. I mean, we really were working with not very good data um, and um, I would have been more aggressive up front with IV if she would have let me, just because I really then wanted to be sure. But um, the only oral drugs that were usable are the two we used. So we're, we weren't sure what was going to happen to her. We tried to get more sputums. We couldn't, right? Right. So um, she did have stable renal function and audiograms on the inhaled amicacin. Uh, we weren't able to get additional sputums during her treatment course, but on the serial CT scans, you can actually see there was um, pretty good response of that cavity to the treatment regimen that she um, did allow us to give her. Um, her cough improved as well, and after 18 months of treatment, um, we uh, stopped her uh, regimen. Uh, however, several months later, she came back again uh, with the return of the non-productive cough over the preceding couple of months. Um, we were able to get sputum uh, this time, which was smear negative and uh, repeated imaging. We started her prior regimen again for a presumed relapse at first, 
Um, as you can see in the last CT scan while she was on treatment in July 2016, the cavity is now completely regressed and it's present again about 10 months later after she had been off treatment for I think six or eight months. Um, so the culture did grow uh, for M. abscessus abscessus with an ERM41 gene uh, and was reported by the lab as macrolide sensitive. So at this point, we actually started to address this, but um, what is the significance of a detectable ERM41 gene in an isolate of M. abscessus when macrolide sensitivity is reported in vitro? It's associated with a more clinically indolent infection and portends a favorable prognosis. It indicates that the organism is exquisitely sensitive to macrolides, or it confers inherent resistance to macrolides, and the reported in vitro sensitivity is an error or D, it confers inducible resistance to macrolides and a 14-day exposure is required before in vitro resistance can be detected. Okay, good, so the answer is D. The, ERM, uh, the active ERM gene confers inducible macrolide resistance. Um, the standard uh, incubation period for uh, many mycobacteriology labs is uh, three days, um, at which point the uh, organism will appear to be um, sensitive, so it's not an error per se. Uh, it's that 14 days of incubation is required before the ERM gene is induced and uh, confers the uh, resistance to the macrolide. This is part of the report um, that we uh, were given, and as you can see, the clarithromycin and azithromycin MICs were in the susceptible range despite the presence of the, of the ERM gene. So I wanted to go back to that. So I kind of wanted to highlight the report because um, you have to know if this is a three-day incubation or a 14-day incubation in a patient who has an ERM gene that's positive. Once you know there's an ERM gene, you know that you have macrolide resistance. And that's part of the problem, I think, with the confusion out there. You yeah. want to comment on yeah, that? Yeah, just, you know, it would be great to know the... Uh, species, subspecies accurately, there's no doubt. But this is the critical data. It doesn't matter what you got. If you've got a rapid grower, uh, even fortuitum has an ERM gene. If you have a rapid grower, th this is the test you have to have. I mean, you can sort things out later uh, with organism identification, but you must know if incubation of the isolate in the presence of macrolide induces macrolide resistance. So now, yeah. And, and duration of incubation. So, and the duration of incubation, so we're not uh, clear on that. Um, is it three days or 14 days with this data? This one, yeah. So, um, so that's, that's part, of the, part of the issue. And since it's M. obsessus obsessus, the likelihood of having uh, macrolide resistance is much higher. So I'm assuming this is a three-day incubation. And so it doesn't go along with it. So, so you need to know that. From the from the prior bug, but that was a Valetti. Right, initially she so now she's idea. got a new inf yeah. a reinfection yeah. with M. obsessus obsessus. So we were very concerned that um, this that she is ma still macrolide resistant. And I think you have to know that when you're looking at the sensitivities that you get back if it's a, just a three-day incubation period that it's not reliable and, and the ERM gene um, detection is more important. Uh, so we started a new treatment regimen at this point of amicacin three times weekly, tagacycline daily with uh, pre-medications to try to prevent nausea and vomiting. She was also uh, approved for clofazamine uh, and eventually started 100 milligrams daily. So her cough has been improving on this regimen, but she had severe diarrhea due to the clofazamine. Uh, nausea with the tegacycline was um, tolerable with uh, pre-medication, so the clofazamine was actually discontinued after a couple of months. Um, so just a few more questions for the panel. Um, how long would you recommend that she stay on this regimen of um, IV amicase and IV tegacycline? Um, and uh, that's it, actually. Um, uh, how long would you continue the IV antibiotics? Uh, do you think that there is a combination of oral and inhaled drugs that could be effective? And is this a patient that you would uh, consult thoracic surgery for at some point? Um, my answer for A is a very long time. I think it's, uh, it depends on how long the patient can tolerate the toxicities and the, the inconvenience of, of having multiple IV agents. 
um, switching someone to a non-IV regimen, I guess after, if, if she's tolerating the tegacycline and IV amicacin for a while, perhaps reintroducing linezolid um, would be a useful addition. Um, perhaps giving her a few months to get the clofazamine crystals out of her bowel, or however it causes the GI intolerance, maybe restarting clofazamine at a lower dose will be tolerable in the long term. Not that I know clofazamine does anything, but um, I have to disagree with Dave. Maybe it does something. Um, so I would I would consider that. And at some, it would really be a sort of a wait and see approach and discuss with the patient to as to when to switch her and. I guess what to switch her to, some people advocate moving from an intensive regimen for amicacin with multiple, at least two IVs plus oral agents. Once you have achieved acceptable improvement or good control of disease, so-called stepping down to a more uh, suppressive type of regimen where you can rid yourself, uh, your patient can rid herself of the IVs and that could mean maybe typically inhaled amicacin, clofazamine, linezolid, and perhaps a macrolide depending on the uh, situation. And I, I, you know, Ted, I, I, I wouldn't, I don't know what clofazamine does for abscesses. I, I, forgive me, I'm, I'm more of a nihilist with MAC, but I, I do think it's a, a it, this, it needs to be studied in abscesses without, without doubt, partly because uh, of the, favorable MICs in vitro. Um, I don't recall the, uh, the imipenem and sapoxetin uh, MICs on this uh, code. The, there was a, a multi-page uh, report. We didn't actually include the entire report. But the sapoxetin, she was sensitive. She had low MICs. That would have been a choice, except that it was multiple times at her day. Yeah, we, we, we do it twice daily. Uh, that and imipenem, and again, this gets back to the philosophy and metaphysical aspects of uh, mycobacteria. But I would certainly consider that another option for her, at least in the short term. And um, I, she looks like a pretty good surgical candidate to me. Uh, based, uh, I don't remember. She didn't seem to have a lot of disease elsewhere, and she's had recurrence with that cavity. Okay. Yeah, I mean bronchiectasis and scattered and drain infection and drain bugs. It's largely that right upper lobe um, yeah. excuse exclusively. Yeah, they could do the they can take that right middle lobe out probably. So I think that's probably gonna be an option because she really doesn't want to stay on intravenous therapy. Um, and uh, I think we're gonna have to explore that. Um, we, we may wait until, we may do what Ted suggested uh, and try an oral regimen um, and then um, we will see if there's progression. We'll follow her very closely. Um, I expect the cavity should be better now. She's been on the IV. We're going to get a CT just to prove that, but she's clinically improved. We'll do the linase liclofazamine uh, at a lower dose, maybe three times a week and then inhale damocasin and then if she progresses again at that point, we will kind of uh, surgery would be the next option. If I remember her PFTs correctly, her FEV1 was like in the 70-something percent predicted. Her DLCO was totally normal. She would hopefully be able to tolerate resection. Well, one other comment. There are some um, recommendations out there uh, for um, transition from parenteral to oral therapy that involve drugs like uh, doxycycline and chloroquinolones and um, uh, Bactrim, um, and I can only say, in my opinion, that would be putting someone on placebo. Uh, so, I, I, uh, there might be folks in the Ann or, or Mark might want to come in if they were on some of the, if they happened to be on a committee that recommended that. I'm not suggesting you guys recommended that, I'm just maybe, a, a, but you, you may see that. And all I can say is, there is just absolutely no data whatsoever to support that approach. And as long as you understand that uh, you're not giving the patient active therapy, uh, I guess it's okay. Yeah, we'll uh, take your questions now. 
uh, third case, any of the first two cases as well. So two questions, Sarah Broad from uh, Toronto. So the first question was about the Bactrim. So I see not infrequently MOSSs that's susceptible to um, Bactrim in vitro. And I get asked this all the time, well, the guidelines do say to base your therapy on drug susceptibility, and you see that it's susceptible, and especially when you're talking about the suppressive regimen, um, are you saying that there's data that it definitely doesn't work, or there's just no data that it does work? And so you, you never use it, even if it shows susceptibility? Well, there's actually data that it works with an organism like Chelone, uh, but not for any of the abscessus subspecies. Um, but there's a lot of drugs that look okay in vitro that don't, don't do squat in vivo. Um, so all I'm saying is that if you, if you switch somebody who's got an ERM gene to azithromycin, doxycycline, and Bactrim, they're basically not being treated. That's, that's my point. Thank you. And I just wanted to make a comment also about the macrolide, and I think this was mentioned, but um, we happen to, in Toronto, have one central lab, which is very helpful, but I would just echo the comment that I think in a situation like this, you really have to call the lab and find out what they're doing. Are they incubating at 14 days? You don't know if they are or they aren't. They've got this huge panel, and they're looking at synergy between amicase and clofazamine, but they're not incubating at 14 days. So I think, and I also, too, find that calling the lab the amobsessus uh, macrolide susceptibility resistance is so complicated and keeps evolving and our lab at least will not only they'll look for those mutations that can cause the ERM41 to be non-functional they'll look for the RRL mutation so I do find it really helpful to work with your lab. Yeah, I, I think it's indispensable as a matter of fact you just can't you can't get you must have accurate information in order to do that. I, there are large reference laboratories in the United States that send you lists of in vitro susceptibilities for these bugs where there's no, there's really, the, the, there, there's not substantiation of the breakpoints on the, uh, uh, for the drugs. And they're not recommended uh, by the CLSI. Um, I don't know what to say about that, uh, other than they shouldn't, they shouldn't be reporting those, uh, those values. Um, Victor Hofstein, Toronto. So these were great cases, difficult ones, obviously. My question is, I'll turn it around the other way. Well, how frequently in your institution you don't treat at all, but only follow, because you don't think there is an active disease, but just infection. So I'm interested in the proportion out of 100 cases of NCM, how many are treated, how many are followed, and what is the proportion of those that are followed that eventually require treatment? So that's a very good question, but I, if you're asking at my institution, I think we get we see uh, a skewed population of patients who have already failed therapy or are progressing. But if you look at the survey data and the the registry data, I think we we'll, we will have uh, answers to that. There's a large proportion of patients that don't need to be treated with antibiotics, particularly in the nodular uh, um, NTM MAI group. Okay, for macrolide resistant or M obsessive species it's going to be different, but for, for MAI patients, again, we don't treat everyone. And how many of those go on? I don't have the numbers um, that don't need to be treated forever, but if there's a, a large percentage of patients yeah. that never need more than airway clearance and monitoring. So you don't have to start, yes, you can wait um, and watch your patient um, and then take it from that point, if, if that's your point. Yeah, well, as a, as a general respirologist, you know, who is a jack of all trades and a, mas and a master of none, majority of my patients that I see with NCM do not require treatment, and I, I treat their bronchiectasis, like what you call airway clearance techniques, but uh, I just... So what we find most frequently, and when they do get referred, is that they're not treated, but they're also not followed, and that's where the problem occurs. Good. So we know you're following all of yours, so then they'll be in good hands. Yeah, uh, yeah I think we can probably take one more question. Uh, my name is Pond Carpenter. Um, I'm one of the fellows from Lakey in Burlington, Massachusetts. Uh, I have, I wanted to get your opinion on this. Um, I have a patient who I just recently picked up, and she has saccular um, bronchiectasis, an MAI that is relatively asymptomatic. Um, there are occasions where she has intermittent hemoptysis, but they're self-limiting and mild, and with uh, airway clearance that we just started on, she's having improvement in that and lessening to no hemoptysis for months now. However, 
when I compare her imaging from now to when she, I got her old imaging recently, it's, it's significantly progressed over the last five years. So it looks a lot worse now than it did before, but I think I'm getting somewhere with airway clearance, but because it's sacular and it looks like it's developed, would you guys treat? And she's positive for MAI. <laughs> Well, I, I would say you've started what sounds like a really important component of therapy. So maybe, although it's good to have her prior films, I think maybe you should continue with your current interventions and see what happens over the next 6 to 12 or 18 months. Um, so maybe it's fine uh, not to treat her. Uh, but I would um, include the caveat as, and ask the question about cavitation because we know patients who have a cavitation, patients who have cavities, have uh, much higher rates of progression and poor survival. Exactly. That's kind of where I'm at right now. So I, I started her on treat. This is uh, the second half of it. I started her on treatment recently, and uh, she ended up going in for a cholecystectomy unrelated. And uh, we just resumed the treatment again. And it looks like when I did the step up on the um, three regimen, adding rifampin last. And it looks like when we added rifampin, she went back into the hospital. I don't know if it's related or not with sepsis, nausea, vomiting, and I, it might be related to rifampin, it might not, so um, I'm not sure if I should back off and just start doing the airway clearance again, or if I should switch antibiotic regimens. We don't have sensitivities, and the last time the only way to get it was through a bronch with the AL. So any thoughts? I figured I've got the expert panel here, so <laughs> might as well ask. Well, I think as Ted had mentioned earlier, I mean, we, you, you do have time. So uh, I, I don't think there would be a problem waiting uh, 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 just a month or two or three to evaluate uh, your patient. Um, just very quickly back to one of the previous uh, points, uh, Wan Jung Ko in, in South Korea has collected some data on people on, on that don't get treated. And it, it looks like about somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of all comers don't require therapy in, in their hands. And that's several hundred or hundreds of patients. Thank you very much. Thank you all for participating in our session. Thank you.